Welcome to this webinar. Bienvenidos a este seminario. Este evento tendrá intervenciones en inglés y en español. Si deseen escuchar la interpretación simultánea en otro idioma, busquen el icono de interpretación que está en la barra de herramientas de Zoom y seleccionen el idioma de su preferencia. This event will have interventions in, in English and Spanish. If you wish to listen the simultaneous interpretation in another language, look for the interpretation icon located in the toolbar of Zoom and select the language of your preference. Good morning and welcome to this webinar. Let's talk about dementia in Latin America and the Caribbean organized by the Inter-American Development Bank. This webinar is part of the Panorama of Aging and Long-Term Care series that began in February of this year. In this series, we invite experts to share their experiences regarding the design, implementation, and evaluation of long-term care systems. My name is Maria Laura Oliveri, and I am part of the team of the Panorama and the Social Protection and Health Division at the Inter-American Development Bank. Last year, at our regional policy dialogue, Adelia Comas presenting, presented an alarming figure. By 2050, there will be 18 million of people living with dementia in Latin America and the Caribbean. We invite you to see the recordings of the events on the web page of the Panorama. Continue with this theme today, we dip deeper into this subject as part of the activities of the World Alzheimer's Month. Is it a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, Paola Barbarino, Chief Executive Officer at Alzheimer's Disease International. You can find more details about Paola Professional's trajectory on the Panorama webinar site and also in the chat of the Zoom. Paola will provide a global perspective on dementia and with a specific focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. She will discuss how our vision is prepared in terms of policies and programs to address mental health and non-communicable diseases. She will outline the role of Alzheimer's Disease International in addressing the global dementia pandemic, and in particular, the organization's response to the global COVID-19 pandemic. We will have 40 minutes of presentations followed by a question and answer sessions of 15 minutes. I invite you to engage with the discussion by posting your questions in the chat. You can put your quest, post your questions in English or in Spanish. Please select the all panelists and attendees option in the chat for doing so. We thank those who already follow our Panorama website. And if you still don't do so, we invite you to follow us. Our Twitter is at BID Gente, and we will be using the hashtag aging and envejecimiento. Without further ado, I will leave the floor to Paola. Good morning or good evening, everyone. I think it's very early morning for you. Thank you, Maria Laura, for such a lovely introduction. Um, I apologize to everybody for speaking in English, despite coming from a uh, Latin language speaking country, but I am based in London, um, as is Alzheimer's Disease International. I uh, am delighted to be given this opportunity to speak to you about such an important topic as dementia, which is becoming a huge and bigger issue by the day. Um, I will start, uh, um, Maria Laura has told you the, the broad line of what I'm talking about. I will uh, have an opportunity today because we got such a large uh, slot of time to tell you a lot about dementia and I hope that this will prompt questions which we'll try and keep at the end of the webinar. Can I please ask for the next slide? 
Alzheimer's Disease International, as I will tell you uh, in a minute, is the organization globally that uh, deals with uh, Alzheimer's disease from an INGO perspective. But also, unusually, we are uh, publishers. So about 15 years ago, nobody really published any data on Alzheimer's and dementia. And we filled that gap, uh, publishing the first data on prevalence and incidence all over the globe. And from that original publication, which was then followed by others, all the figures that you have ever heard about dementia have been derived. So for example, you may have heard that every three seconds, someone in the world developed dementia, that dementia was a $1 billion disease in 2018. And we forecast that it will be a $2 trillion disease uh, by 2030. The estimated growth in number of people with dementia uh, is 2020 in, in this year, and is estimated to grow globally to 152 uh, by 2050. Um, now, COVID-19 will have had an impact, sadly, on those numbers, and I will tell you more about that later. Uh, it also has uh, to be said that uh, together with these figures, there's a lot more figures behind them and uh, we have plenty of reports. I'll tell you later how to find them. Now, if I can ask for the next slide. To bring this in the perspective of Latin America and the Caribbean, we estimated that in the Americas, there is about 11.4 million people living with dementia currently. In uh, Latin America, which I consider to be uh, Central America and South America, however, you know, there are a billion definitions, uh, we estimate it to be 6 million, North America 5 million, in the Caribbean around 480,000. These figures are only as adjourned as our last report, which was published in 2015. Now, what I really need to tell you about dementia is uh, uh, quite important because quite a lot of people still don't get this. First of all, uh, dementia is a disease and is a, um, something that you get uh, through a number of other routes. So people often are confused about what's Alzheimer's, what is dementia, how, how do the two work together? Well, there are 105 known ways, as I speak to you, uh, to develop dementia. And one of them is Alzheimer's disease. So if you imagine that you have 105 routes to get to dementia, and one of them is the most famous one, Alzheimer's disease, which occurs in about 75% of cases, that hopefully will, will, will explain you a little bit more why there is such a confusion. Um, Alzheimer's disease is the most common one, uh, 50 to 75 percent of cases, it's usually 75 percent, but there are some countries, for example, some in Central America, where cardiovascular um, uh, disease that leads to dementia is way more com uh, common. So we usually speak about vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia, and Lewy body dementia as being the other three most common uh, way, but there is a lot of other dementia and indeed one can have mixed dementia. Uh, there are also some dementia which are associated with one particular condition, for example, HIV, or in some cases, alcohol. Uh, so we are talking of a lot of conditions and we are talking also of the fact that um, uh, as there are 105 ways, there may be more. By the time I have been most in, uh, in uh, I've been to AADI for about three years, and during this period, the three or four new routes have been dis, uh, discovered. Now, there are common elements. First of all, developing Alzheimer's, for example, doesn't necessarily lead to dementia, and this causes other confusion. And there are issues that are common uh, to all dementias. There are problems usually with memory loss, with thinking speed, with language, with understanding, and with judgment. And this also leads to other issues. For example, they accompany the dementia as it can be a social behavior or motivation. But uh, one of the things that has been most interesting for us uh, in the last uh, couple of years, we have 
started working a lot on uh, awareness and stigma. And I'll tell you a little bit more uh, later, but one of the findings of our major report last year is that 62% of healthcare practitioners, so this is doctors and nurses, not just anyone, uh, believe that dementia is old age, it's not a disease. So the most important thing I have to tell you today, dementia is a disease. You have an organ, which is the brain, if you look at that organ without dementia, it does look a, like, a, like a healthy organ. If you look at it with dementia, it looks like a, a shrunk, shriveled organ at the end of the dementia. So you're looking at a, a physical disease that attack one of the organs of our body. It is not old age. And this is one of the greatest challenges we have because a lot of governments, especially governments in uh, lower and middle income countries do not uh, pursue education in their workforce uh, to explain that this is a disease and it has to be treated as such and it has to be diagnosed. Uh, by perpetuating the idea that dementia is, a, um, uh, is not a disease, uh, you are actually creating a lot of problem for those that have dementia, but also for the families. So if earlier we were saying that currently in the world there are 50 million people with dementia, uh, we can also presume that there are many, many more millions impacted by dementia. And these are all the families and relatives of the people that are living with dementia. And I'm sure that in the audience that we have today, there will be several people that have experiences of dementia in their family as it is unfortunately so prevalent. There are other mythology associated with dementia. For example, that dementia is a part of old age. Dementia is not necessarily a setting in old age. The most common time to develop dementia is 65 years old, and this is all over the globe. However, in countries where the diagnostics are way more advanced, I'm thinking, for example, of Japan or the UK, uh, more and more uh, people are being diagnosed in their 40s and 50s. We call this early onset dementia. People that are diagnosed early may have 10, 20 years of life ahead of them. And it's so important to know what's happening in order to maintain a decent, good quality of life, both for the person living with dementia and for the relatives that who knows who to, what to expect. And this is why raising awareness of dementia is so crucial. Next slide, please. Um, actually, I'm going to jump now to the next slide. Uh, uh, next slide, please, and the one after. Next slide, please. Thank you. And then I'm going to go back. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about us. Uh, we are Alzheimer's Disease International. We were established in 1984. And we are the umbrella organization of Alzheimer's Association around the world. We have 102 members association and federations, and that is in as many countries. We can only have one member per country. And we have 18 associations currently who are working, who are studying to become a member. And I will tell you a little bit more about that later. We are also in official relations with the WHO, and we are the only uh, INGO which is in official relations with WHO related to dementia. Our vision as an organization has always been that prevention, care, and inclusion need to happen today in the hope that we will have a cure tomorrow. We currently do not have a cure for uh, Alzheimer's or dementia, and therefore it's important that we still afford the quality of life to those that are diagnosed with dementia today. Uh, now, I wanted to tell you a bit more about us because many people don't know that there is a global organization dealing with Alzheimer's and dementia. And indeed, the whole community of Alzheimer's and dementia moved very late. If you think about it, Alzheimer's and cancer were discovered at the same time at the end of the 19th century. But whilst the Cancer Association, the international one, was founded in the 30s, uh, in the 20th century, we were funded about 60 years later. And this in part accounts for the fact that we are so much less known. And this in part is derived from the stigma so many people didn't even want to think of dementia as a disease. People didn't want to talk about it. And part of what we do is normalize this discussion to make it uh, happen so that people stop considering people with dementia as lesser citizens. 
in some countries, people with dementia are still treated as lesser citizens and their treatment is akin to imprisonment, isolation. There is a lot of abuse going on. There are definitely human rights are being trampled. So our scope, our purpose is to make sure that nobody is left behind, all countries are included, and that we continue to explain to people that this is a disease and as such has to be treated. Now, can I ask you to go two slides back, please? Just a couple, thank you so much. So what I want to tell you about now, because you are in the Inter-American Development Bank, you will know that uh, when you talk about um, diseases, you often are labeled under one particular label or another. And I wanted to explain this a little bit further. Uh, with dementia, it's very difficult. Um, and dementia touches on so many aspects, and we will go into that later that is very hard to put it under a particular label. Nevertheless, it happens all the time. Um, we, for example, are associated with the mental health team at the WHO, Mental Health and Substance Misuse. Um, we, uh, in a way, uh, we, we are very lucky and fortunate to work with the Brain Health Unit at WHO because they're such a brilliant group of people and they really understand uh, dementia. But many people are quite perplexed about that because they feel that mental health and dementia shouldn't be put together. Dementia is a neurocognitive disorder, that is a disease of the brain and it's got nothing to do with mental health. Nevertheless, we don't mind being associated in this element because there is a lot of issues that have to do with mental health that affect both people living with dementia and their carer. There's a lot of uh, isolation and stigma that lead to depression, to anxiety, uh, financial issues that also lead to anxiety. And therefore, it is actually quite an important part. And we certainly campaign uh, for mental health as well as for dementia. Um, there is also an element about the visibility of dementia. We campaign for visible, invisible disability to be treated as visible disability. Our latest World Alzheimer's report was on that topic. I'll tell you about that more later. So in a way, it is important for us that dementia is considered as a uh, disability, an invisible one. Um, and there is, uh, as I said, a similarity of symptoms or experiences, support, stigma, human rights. Um, there is also a point about psychosocial determinants and there's also a point about social care and support. The two often uh, run together. Can I have the next slide, please? I also wanted to give you the, um, uh, the, the a comparator with uh, the non-communicable diseases debate. Um, the dementia risk profile is very similar to other major NCDs. Uh, and there is a common occurrence of comorbidities, but they're often grouped separately. There are certain things that are definitely more uh, on the dementia side, like social isolation, head trauma, are risk factors that are more associated with dementia. But actually, a lot of the other risk factors are very, very similar. Um, and uh, going, uh, and you can see here on this slide, a lot of uh, elements also of our campaignings about risk reduction, and we publish a lot on risk reduction as well. Um, I haven't got a slide on this, but I also wanted to mention that universal health coverage is also where we sometimes find dementia mentioned. Um, that is an important one for us. We believe that if universal health coverage was afforded to everybody, we wouldn't have an issue about uh, providing care for people with dementia because governments would do it anyway. So we support that, um, but usually it's not a very strong element of our advocacy. Uh, finally, obviously there is an element is relating to healthy aging, uh, aging well, um, uh, silver economy. Of course, we work a lot with the aging community in general including the palliative care community. And we work in general also with an element of uh, sustainable development goals in, in our mind. There are a couple of SDGs that uh, sort of focus on what we do. So this is to give you a little bit of a landscape. However, we have a real issue here because if we follow all these labels, none of these really addresses our major issue. And our major issue is that there is a lack of care 
there is a lack of provision of services for the families of those who live with dementia and for those living with dementia. We know that if you live with dementia and you are afforded cognitive stimulation, um, if you are able to access a day center or therapy, you are going to live with dementia much better in your own home. And we know that the access to social care is an important element of every family that has a relative living with dementia. We know that, for example, during COVID-19, there have been major issues there, and I'll tell you more later. So can I have the next slide and the one after? Thank you very much. Now, to continue on this issue of global policy, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the WHO Global Action Plan on Dementia. So um, we uh, advocated uh, for this plan, and I'll tell you a little bit later about what we did. Um, and the plan is for us, um, everything that we always ask for is a standalone plan on a disease, which is very unusual, as you know, uh, but it's an extremely important plan and it was adopted uh, unanimously in 2017. But in my experience of working in international development, the fact that a plan has been approved unanimously doesn't mean that anything will happen about it. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it later on. The action areas of the plan are seven, and we believe that each one of them is necessary in order to resolve the dementia problem. So the first one is that dementia has to be a public health priority. The second is that there has to be an increase in awareness and friendliness towards dementia. People need to understand that people with dementia are just part of society and we need to integrate them, not isolated into society. It's very important also to focus on risk reduction, as I just pointed out. And the fourth area is on diagnosis, treatment, care and support. Imagine how enormous is that area alone. But for example, we know that diagnosis is really super important. Actually, we estimate that there is a misdiagnosis uh, or a lower diagnosis in a uh, higher income country. We estimate that only 70% of people are diagnosed in a uh, higher income country. In lower middle income country, we, we get into 50% or less. So there's a huge amount. And if people don't know what they have, then the family get very confused, then you can look for treatment or care or support. And this creates huge amount of issues. This can lead people to suicide. So we as a society have a duty to do something about this. The area number five is the support for dementia carers an extremely important area because as I said, it affects an even higher number of people than the 50 million people that live with dementia. Finally, there are two important technical areas. One is the information system for dementia. The WHO set up a global dementia observatory that was about uh, 2017. The global dementia observatory has been functioning but not yet at full speed. And it asks the government to bring data into the WHO that then uh, can tell us how the governments are coping with the targets of the plan. The plan should aim to have these seven areas pretty much covered by all nations by uh, 2025, actually by 80% of nations in some area. Um, but the, 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 the mechanism of the GDO doesn't work perfectly well. And I will tell you later what we are doing as civil society to monitor what governments are doing. Finally, area seven is dementia research and innovation, an extremely important area. As I said, we believe treatment and care comes first because we are still waiting for a cure. But certainly if governments don't put research money uh, into research, we are never going to find the cure. And another thing which is very interesting is that certain groups of population are being left out uh, because their government are not putting uh, funding into research or because there are regulatory uh, obstacles uh, to people being enrolled in clinical trials or people don't know the clinical trials are even available or clinical trials don't happen. So there is a huge area also that is related to that. Now, uh, ADI is inactive in all of this area. There is a wealth of information on our website on each one of these areas, and we do plenty of webinars around that. Now, my next slide brings you a little bit back to what we do as ADI. So we have a quite complex uh, um, uh, strategy. 
uh, which is uh, we were founded by the US, UK, Canada, and Australia about uh, in 1984, as I said. And then the first 15 years of our life, we built the network that uh, allowed us then to become fully uh, recognized and acknowledged with the WHO and the UN. And then we started advocating for a global plan. We got the global plan in 2017, and then our strategy changed. Uh, we started increasing our multilateral president, uh, presence more horizontally with other organizations, with other mechanisms like the OECD, the G7, the G20, and other global bodies. We have a large ambassador program that includes the Queen of Spain, uh, and the president of Costa Rica, or about two people that are in Spanish speaking languages. Uh, we are also strengthening the regional networks, uh, civil society and government level. And this is in the context of me speaking to you. Uh, so just as I'm speaking to you at IADB, I'm also speaking to the Asian Development Bank or to ASEAN. And it has to be said that although we have a lot of members in South America, our links at regional levels are much stronger in Asia, uh, where our members are much stronger. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about also later, about what is the UIADP can help us with. And then our strategy is to work with our member towards the achievement of national dementia plan. And we do this in an array of ways. Um, now, um, uh, in some cases, this implies a, a very in-depth study of each country healthcare system. Uh, we uh, have been in touch with Pablo Iberran uh, with one particular project we are working in, in which, for example, we are examining the healthcare system of three um, uh, Caribbean and Latin American countries, Mexico, Brazil, and Jamaica where we are looking at what kind of interventions could be done in order to strengthen their dementia response. Uh, similar to this project, which is one uh, which has been put together by the London School of Economics, uh, Adelina Comas Herrera that you heard last year. We also have many other projects of similar nature that we work with with other institutions. So whenever there is a global element, we try and be involved so that our members can get the best benefit our members, please bear in mind, are always civil society, so they're always NGO. Now, if I can get the next slide, please. So our objectives in general are to raise global awareness about dementia, and we do that through a number of mechanisms. World Alzheimer's Month, which is uh, this month, the 21st was World Alzheimer's Day, is one of ADI uh, premier activity. We invented the, the, the activity and it's been incredibly successful. I'll tell you more about it later. We have another aim, which is to build and to strengthen Alzheimer's Association throughout the world. If an Alzheimer's Association is poor, if an Alzheimer's Association doesn't have any means, it cannot negotiate with its government. The government is not going to take it seriously, and we are not going to end up with a national plan. And we at ADI help them get into that level of negotiation. We create uh, teaching, we create growing opportunities, we create opportunities for them to meet their government because, of course, we have access to their government through the WHO and UN mechanisms. So we support these associations so they are also, as well as advocating, they're also better able to meet the needs of the people that live with dementia and their carers and make those lives better if possible. We, as an organization, advocate for people with dementia and their carers on a global level. And as I was saying a minute ago, we stimulate research, especially in lower and middle income countries, where those particular groups of people that are very badly served by the current research community are. So next slide, please. OK, so let me tell you a little bit about the Global Action Plan and how it also impacts Latin America. So after the plan was launched, as I said, I did not believe that anything would happen until we, we followed up what was going on with the plan. And we started publishing a report. We've just published from plan to impact number three. And in this report, we monitor how countries individually are doing with implementing their national plan. And I have to say, uh, we only have at the moment 32 countries, next slide please, with a national plan. So we are extremely concerned 
uh, because the target of the plan is to have uh, compliance by 2025. We're only five uh, years down the line and COVID now is in the way. And already before we weren't doing brilliantly, so we're very concerned. You can see here the situation in, in uh, um, Latin, uh, sorry, in Central and South America. At the moment, the only countries with a plan are Costa Rica and uh, Chile. Uh, Mexico has a plan, which is great, but the plan is not funded. And that is, of course, a great concern. But there are also some rays of hope. For example, the Dominican Republic, as I'll tell you in a minute, has just approved its plan, which is wonderful after many years of work. Uh, now, if I could have the next slide, please. Now, I'm going to move a little bit into World Alzheimer's Month. So World Alzheimer's Month is held since 2012. Uh, the 21st is World Alzheimer's Day. Um, and it's becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger activity. In 2019, we had 90 countries. And we know that this year we've beaten this record. So we are about to publish the data uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, and this year it was even more incredible because of course the primary campaigns had to come to a halt uh, because of the COVID-19 restrictions. We took a pulse of how we were doing uh, on the 17th of, of September. And whereas in 2029, by that time we had had about 1 million impressions on social media, this is something that is easy to measure. This year we had had 12 million. So it is undoubted that the campaign is getting a bigger and bigger traction. Uh, now, if I could have next slide, please. The topic of the campaign this year was let's talk about dementia. This is a campaign that we uh, started with PAHO last year. So it came about because I went to speak with a um, public health minister of a um, South American country, which will remain unnamed. And I asked this public health minister whether they could do a public health campaign in their country uh, on dementia. And he told me, uh, very friendly, it was a private meeting, that they would never do that because uh, their priority was around uh, maternal health and there was no interest really in helping the aged population. So that shocked me, but also was a good catalyst for me to have action. Um, I went to speak with Paho immediately and I say, look, well, unless we do it ourselves, this is not going to happen. So we launched a, a great campaign last year, uh, which has had good traction in South America. Although we know that for a campaign to really embed itself in the population, you have to run it for two or three years. Now, this year, this has given us an opportunity to use the campaign to this pilot, if you wish, that we had done in a whole continent and to make it global. So the Let's Talk About Dementia campaign, which was originally Hablem of the Dementia, uh, has become a Let's Talk About Dementia and it's been rolled out in over 50 languages all over the world, where, as I say to you, on the 17th of September, we had had 12 million impressions and we are hoping that's going to become even bigger by the time we start sitting down and counting in the first week of October. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in World Alzheimer's Month, one of the important things that we do, as well as the campaign, which of course coalesces people doing marches, teas, and whatever it is that people do in order to raise awareness, we also publish the World Alzheimer's Report. What you have here is the collection of World Alzheimer's Report since the first one we published in 2009, which was on prevalence and incidence, so the data. But since then, we have become um, known for our innovation, for our groundbreaking. We publish things before everybody else. We publish things on long-term care, on short-term care, on risk reduction. Uh, very, very early on. And we tried to make what we publish understandable. The World Alzheimer Report in 2018, which was on research and why don't we get a, ground, a breaking of grounds on research, was written by a journalist in a language that is very clear to understand. And that is because I felt that the general public didn't understand why we can find a cure for dementia. So if you're curious, read that. It's very simply written very clearly written and it explains exactly where we are with research. Although these years we are about to have probably two big groundbreaking announcements, maybe three, 
and so we are hoping for some therapeutic breakthrough. The report last year uh, was on stigma and awareness 2019. That's the one where we got the statistics that 62% of healthcare practitioners don't think that dementia is a disease. So that gave us a, 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 the point of what we have to work towards. This is why we needed to do a blame of the dementia because if the doctors don't speak about it, imagine in general public, we need to educate more people and governments and public health ministry need to educate their doctors. And this is again where you at the IADB can really give us a big help. Um, the World Alzheimer's Report 2019 was a survey of 70,000 people in about 130 countries. And it returned surprising result is a mine of information. So I um, encourage you to delve at least in the executive summary. Uh, next slide, please. The World Alzheimer's Report this year is yet very different. We just launched it on the 21st. It's called Design, Dignity and Dementia. And it's about best practice in design uh, from home setting to daycare center to uh, long-term care facilities to hospital. The main tenet of the report is that people with dementia deserve dignity, deserve is their human rights to have a place where they can live well. And the important thing is that design is akin to a non-pharmaceutical intervention. So you can achieve things with design that you cannot achieve with, um, with medicine. For example, people with dementia tend to be very confused or frustrated if they have doors in their long-term care facility that they cannot open. They see a door, but they cannot open. A person with dementia understands full well that they are prisoners in that point. And why should we make them feel like that? There is a host of ideas on how not to make people feel that they are in a prison. So uh, plenty of wonderful ideas like that to apply either in the domestic setting or in the institutional setting. The report is 500 pages long, is a, 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 a compendium of everything that is good in the world about architecture is already been called the ultimate piece of work on design, architecture and dementia. So if you're interested, uh, that it's an important one. There are a lot of examples from South America. Next slide, please. So um, a little slide about this PAHO uh, campaign that we did, which is specifically on, uh, let's talk about dementia. All the materials are originally in Spanish. Here you see the English ones. Um, so it was all about the first difficult conversation about uh, making sure the primary care uh, practitioners know about dementia. And so this is a campaign. Uh, everything that we produce is all free. Uh, so if you ever wanted to uh, introduce it in some of the countries that you work with, you would be very welcome to have all the material and assets uh, free of charge or asking us. Next slide, please. So this particular campaign, um, it looked at a number of things, but one of the important one was a timely diagnosis. Uh, one of the things that we know is that in uh, South America and Central America, there's a particular problem with diagnosis. People are not diagnosed. And this again can cause enormous stress to families. Uh, one of the most important essays in the 2019 World Alzheimer's Report was from Mexico, where a lady wrote a beautiful piece. I think we were all in tears about she had considered suicide with her husband once they had realized what he had. Um, and that was because she didn't get any post-diagnostic support. So together with the diagnosis, it's also important to help people understand what they can do after a diagnosis. Otherwise, you really are condemning them to desperation. Um, next slide, please. Um, I've seen that there are some questions, uh, which I'm trying to see whilst I'm also speaking, which is difficult around risk factors. Uh, well, we have a huge amount of information on our website about that, uh, and you are very welcome to plunder that. There is infographics, there is practical uh, advice, and we are also updating that because there has been a recent report uh, which has added the three new risk factors for dementia. One of them is head trauma, 
just to give you an example, but there are others and, uh, for example, hearing issues uh, and there is quite a lot that people can do. In uh, this particular example that I've brought you here, there are two things which are different for dementia than from other non-communicable diseases. Uh, you need to stimulate your brain, you need to socialize. Socialization is so important uh, in dementia. And unfortunately, obviously the COVID-19 situation has created issues of which I'll tell you uh, more about. Uh, but also you need to do a number of things like a healthy diet, looking after your heart, um, again, there are infographics. There was one in one of the previous slides that showed you the one that had the connection with the non-communicable disease uh, movement. And uh, again, all this material is available on our website. So you can, uh, you can contact us and we have no copyright problems. So you can use our material as you wish. Uh, if I can uh, look at the next slide. So, for the, um, for the risk reduction, I have to say there is a simple thing that we can do. You know, you can easily go to a government and say, look, you know, why don't also say to your population that if you do these things, look after your heart and eat well and stop smoking, you also help dementia. It's a simple message, a simple communication. Now, um, I just wanted to tell you other outcomes that come from us campaigning. We always try to bring together an Alzheimer's association, as I told you, with their Ministry of Health and also with their PAHO country office. And through PAHO, we also access some ministries of health that we hadn't, um, we, uh, hadn't uh, contacted before. As a consequence of that, uh, some countries have moved forward their uh, national dementia plan work. Uh, one of them is Jamaica, as I told you, uh, but also in July 2020, uh, we we're delighted to see the Dominican Republic finally launch a plan. They'd worked on that for many, many years, but the possibility of launching it during COVID was extraordinary. We were all incredibly delighted that they could have done that. Now I'm going to open this chapter on COVID and uh, COVID-19 and dementia. I'm just checking my time. I will be quite quick. Um, so we have had a lot of issues around COVID-19. Uh, there are mental health issues that are emerging, isolation, anxiety, stress and depression. A lot of discrimination of older people in general and people in dementia particularly. Uh, we've seen complication of other uh, non-communicable diseases. We've seen a lot of scarcity of resources and crucially we've seen a lot of doctors having to make triage decisions that excluded people with dementia uh, from a treatment for COVID. And you have to remember that if people are diagnosed with early onset, this may mean turning away people in their 40s and in their 50s who have dementia but don't have other comorbidities just because they have dementia. And this is a massive human rights problem, which we've been raising with a number of people. We've seen that there's been issues with delayed diagnosis and definitely with post-diagnostic support and with any services. And finally, we've seen that there's been an interruption of clinical trials and of research. Most recently, and can I ask you for the next slide, please? Um, we have been looking um, at the fact that governments are not collecting data on people with dementia dying from COVID. And we know now, because we started asking the governments ourselves, that in Italy is estimated that 22 of those, sorry, of 20% of those dying with COVID died of dementia, died with dementia. Uh, that 25%, 26% in England of those died with COVID died with dementia and 66% in Canada. So the figures are actually very, very scary indeed. And it looks like our community has been disproportionately affected. Uh, but what did we do with COVID? We were working with our Asian members because we were preparing a big conference in Singapore. So we were very quick to understand what was going on. In February, we were already ready. We wrote uh, something quite important with our Chinese member, which was published all over the world on care for people with dementia during lockdown. We then uh, started understanding that there was a problem with triage. So I wrote about it very early on, but then we also published a number of formal position papers on this, uh, advising families to uh, think before bringing a loved one to, um, 
uh, to a hospital uh, if they didn't want to be disconnected and that person not receiving treatment. We've also written uh, a length about issues with long-term care facilities and the fact that uh, people weren't allowed to visit loved one and giving suggestions on what to do. But some of the suggestions has also been practical. For example, people with dementia are terribly confused by people treating them with masks. What can you do to avoid that? There were incredible examples in advocacy. Our France and Taiwan member had to advocate with their governments in order to stop them from finding people with dementia wandering in the streets without masks or without social distancing. So these were important examples of how members helped each other. And we helped each other uh, very quickly, gathering resources from all over the world in 50 plus languages. And we started understanding that there was a lot of interest in what we were doing. And we started doing public webinars on it, which are all available on our YouTube channel. Next slide, please. Um, we also launched an emergency appeal for us, for our members, because of course everybody had serious fundraising issue. We sidelined our business plan entirely and started working on COVID only. Uh, because we are a very agile, very small organization, we could change very, very quickly. And also we spent a lot of time looking after the well-being of our own staff. Uh, which doesn't work together anyway, uh, but they started experiencing stress as we were working incredibly hard 24-7. Next slide, please. Um, but generally, uh, we had uh, a number of concerns. And now with COVID-19, our concerns are that our constituency rights were thoroughly trampled, that there was not enough information on practical issues, and that governments would deprioritize dementia after everything became normal again. Next slide, please. So I've been pretty much through these uh, issues, the, the wealth of resources that we made available, and they're all on our website. There is a whole section on COVID-19 in a huge amount of languages, and we are also focusing on minority groups, indigenous communities, uh, so refugees, so you can find a huge amount of resources uh, on our website, as well as giving a voice to a number of people. We just published, for example, a really good blog uh, from a person with dementia in the UK that speaks about the consequences of uh, cognitive deterioration that are happening for people with dementia in England as a consequence of not having any more contacts or cognitive stimulation. So people that were living quite happily in their home, now they are deteriorating very, very quickly. Next slide, please. Um, so there is a lot, again, as I said, presentation and material that are available. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some of the position papers that we publish. Some of them uh, make quite uh, a sad reading, but they are important. And we presented a number of statements at the WHO and in other, in other multilateral contexts. Next slide, please. Um, this is one of our webinars, for example, which were extremely well attended. And then the public webinars became hugely attended. So we had hundreds of people. And consider that we are a B2B organization. You know, normally we speak to people that know what we speak about. So for us, having a huge amount of interest outside our, our group has been a new thing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so there are an, a number of concerns at the moment with COVID-19, uh, the excess dementia mortality in long-term care facilities, the diagnosis rates have decreased because people didn't go to get a diagnosis, the impact on cognitive decline, palliative care being withdrawn in hospital and at home, triage guidelines being a problem, and psychosocial support being just absent, and the consequence on it, especially in higher income countries, has been terrible. Next slide, please. Uh, but there have been also some positive things. For example, uh, telemedicine has been a positive thing. The delivery of support services through online services for those that can access them in Africa, they've had some issues. Um, it's been quite heartwarming in many, many ways. Uh, in South America, in particular, Argentina has been very, very active in delivering uh, online support. 
So uh, this is our future gazing slide. We are looking at these five points as big points. One of them I haven't talked about is the development of vaccines. We are now very involved also with the WHO to try and understand when a vaccine will be available, how will our vulnerable community uh, access that. Now, next two slides are very quick so that we have time for some questions. So the number of people with dementia will increase uh, in South America. We don't have members yet in some countries like Antigua and Barbuda, Belize and Dominica, uh, Grenada and Haiti, Paraguay and St. Lucia. The other one actually in uh, um, uh, Colombia, for example, or in Panama, we have got members that are in our school of becoming members. Um, but we could ask for your help in finding member uh, in nations. So this means finding a group of volunteers, a group of doctors or a group that can form itself a civil society. And then we will teach them how to become a proper uh, Alzheimer organization. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, in general, we really uh, can use your help in a number of ways. You have this old strand on old age. Uh, in South America, as you saw from the previous slide, people are getting older, uh, more older. So dementia will become increasingly a problem. What could we do together? Could you help us negotiate with governments in, in order to try and have funded national dementia plans? Could you help us foster public-private sector collaborations? Are there companies that we could work with? We work with a huge amount of companies. We have uh, a lot of uh, companies that help us. Um, we also need funders. Uh, our members, a lot of our members in Latin America are very poor. They are uh, volunteer organizations. They're extremely well organized and providing services, but they normally don't have um, full-time staff so that prevents them from having a um, dialogue with their governments. We often find that that's the case. If a organization is staffed only by volunteers, very rarely it has traction with the government. Can you help us think about companies that could work with our members where we can introduce the member to a company and then they can work together on a national plan. Uh, but also what kind of policy responses, having heard what I've told about the wider policy environment could facilitate uh, more work in South America. South America is an, in Central America and the Caribbean are important areas for us. Um, there is a huge amount of volunteer traction, but we need to do more for them. So I hope I've given you a panoramic. I hope uh, we can start with the um, questions and I, pass the floor to Maria Laura for the question. Thank you. Please stay in touch. You, I am on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever you, just stay in touch and follow what we do. This is the best thing that you can do. Thank you, Maria Laura. Thank you very much, Paola, for your presentation. We are very pleased to provide this space for these types of conversation. And we are ready to start the question and answer se session that will be very short, but uh, still we will have time for some questions. The, uh, thank you for the participants, for all the questions, thanks to the chat. Uh, I will start with the first question. It's from Leonardo from Nicaragua. Uh, he said, What's the, what is the impact of dementia on families and family caretakers, and how can a system of long-term -term care help? And a related question from Patricia from Chile says, what are the good models of uh, support for families of persons with dementia and what are the best practices? Okay, so um, uh, I could speak about an hour only about each of these mm -hmm. topics. Very briefly, I will tell you that about long-term care, um, our World Alzheimer Report 2020, the one that talk about design and dementia, gives the best um, a recommendation on what makes a good long-term care environment. From the point of view of family care, we published the report in 2016 about that, uh, but I can tell you the impact on family is immense. I've spoken during the presentation about the fact that some people even think or commit suicide as a consequence of not being supported. I think the most important thing is after diagnosis, well, to have a diagnosis, for the family to know, because Actually, for each of those roads, of the 105 roads, the evolution of the disease is quite 
understandable. So you can prepare families to understand what is going to happen. A family that knows what's going to happen is able to look after the person with dementia better and after itself. It has to be said that certain countries prefer the outside of the home caring facilities. Some other countries look after their relatives at home more. So this also depends on the country or actual way of dealing with the dementia. So I would have to say that each country has a different approach. Now, in your country, you talked about Nicaragua, and I don't know where the second person was. We have an association in Nicaragua. Um, so the association yeah. in Nicaragua could best give um, some idea of what is the situation uh, specifically to that particular country. Uh, and we can, of course, facilitate that introduction. Thank you very much, Paola. Uh, we have uh, one more question because we ran out of time, but uh, this question is from Pablo from Mexico. And he says, what is the implication of dementia not being a mental health issue? And why this distinction is so important? So dementia is a neurocognitive disorder. That means that the organ, which is the brain, if you did an autopsy, uh, a, a healthy brain and a dementia brain don't look the same, they're different. The dementia brain is effectively a shriveled brain. When you're looking at a mental health disorder, that's not the case. So you cannot see a deterioration of the actual organ in mental health. So the distinction is a medical distinction. You're talking of an organ failure rather than something else that we still cannot define with mental health. So as I said, we don't mind being in the mental health group, but it's important to remember that mental health, uh, that dementia is a physical disease, because if a doctor doesn't understand that, then they cannot give the right advice to uh, the person that is having dementia. So with dementia, your brain will progressively lose functions in a very clear pattern so for each stages of the disease, you can advise the person. And there is no medication, whilst for mental health, sometimes there is. Uh, thank you, Paola. You've given us a very important elements to take into account in the discussion going forward. Uh, well, many thanks to Paola for participating and, and sharing your work at Alzheimer's Disease International. And well, thank you for all the more than a hundred participants who follow us do, during this webinar. We are delighted to host this kind of technical discussion and push forward uh, the long-term care policy in our region. In a few days, you will receive an email with the links to access the recordings of this uh, webinar and the PowerPoint presentation. You can also download these materials from our Panorama website. Uh, we don't know uh, yet the, the exact date of, uh, for our next webinar, but uh, stay tuned. We will be including the information in our website soon. I want to take a minute to recognize the people who made this seminar possible, in particular, the rest of the team of the Panorama on Aging and Long-Term Care at the IDB. Marco Stampini, Natalia Aranco, and Nadine Medellin. Thanks also for all the technical and communication support to Diego Vapore, Soledad Planes, Sandra Iriarte, Lisi Manrique, Sol Sasa Tornil, uh, the interpreters and the rest of the technical team behind the cameras. Uh, and have a good day. Thank you very much. <laughs>